Right. All right, guys, welcome back to my channel. So today we've got a very special guest, Taylor McKenzie, who is a British superbike racer, and he's joined me on my first ever video podcast. So Taylor, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for giving me your time. Hello. Nice to see you. Yeah. Uh, I was going to mention to you earlier that something like 55% of my viewers are in America. So even oh, really? though I'm, yeah, even though I'm English and I'm in Japan, hardly anyone from England or Japan watches it. Yeah. So, yeah, so I thought it's probably best if I give a sort of a, a bit of a, a background on you, because I'm sure some of the people won't know who you are if they're yeah. in America. So this is slightly outdated, uh, but I got this from Wikipedia and from your website. So I'll just read it and you can tell me where I'm wrong. So, uh, so Taylor McKenzie was born in Stirling, Scotland, to parents Neil and Jan. At the age of seven years old, he made the move down with his family to Ashby de la Zouche. Is that how you say that? Yeah, but as I'm a bike racer, I tried to miss the de la Zouche. It sounds too <laughs> Yeah. Popular, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say Ashby. <laughs> yeah. So having um, a three times British Superbike champion as a father, he meant that racing motorbikes was pretty much in his DNA. His brother Taron also races in the British Superbike Ch Championship and they both live and train together at home in the Midlands. Uh, so Taylor rode bikes r from the age of four, beginning his career at 14, travelled the globe to race motorbikes ever since. So it says here your most successful season was 2016. Is that what would you, would you agree with that? Yeah. 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 So you won the British Superstock 1000 Championship. Yeah, that was our race for the Bill based BMW team. It actually yeah. followed probably my worst season in racing in 2016. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it was my most successful year. I had seven wins, a few lap records, and managed to wrap the championship up. So yeah, that was my best year. Yeah, I, I remember you saying in one of your videos that normally your best season is following your worst season or something like that. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Not, at the time when you're having your worst year, it's the worst thing ever. But when I get to the end of the season, yeah. I think it just lights the fire in my belly to... I don't do better. <laughs> yeah, you, just, you get a lot of doubters during the year and you get people that think, oh, well, he's not got it anymore. He can't do it. And yeah. I don't know what it is. That really sparked something in me to prove people wrong and yeah. just do a good job and do it for myself as well because there's, racing's amazing when it's going well, but it's a really hard sport when it's not. So it's nice yeah. to have a good season after you've had a bad one. Yeah, yeah. I Like... um this is kind of probably going to sound weird, but the first time I ever rode a bike on track was this year. So really? yeah, before I, I raced cars from when I was 18 onwards. So I knew how to race and I, you know, like the race craft, if you want to call it that. And I just assumed that as soon as I got on a bike, I'd be able to translate that straight onto two wheels and it would just didn't happen. So at the local track here, my best ever time in a car was one minute and one second, which is pretty quick. And then on the bike, I got one minute, 12 seconds. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to sell my leathers and take, a, <laughs> get, take up a, like knitting or something. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot less grip when you've only got two wheels. Yeah, I know. It's, it's totally different when you, your body is sort of like, you know, you're not inside with a cage around you. You just... Anything yeah. happens and it's going to hurt, you know. <laughs> I think okay. it's always dangerous when it goes the other way, when bike racers go car racing because yeah. suddenly bike racers think they're invincible. <laughs> I've seen a lot of accidents in that situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there's a, well, there's a few famous racers that did make that change quite successfully, but only a few, I guess. Yeah, there's been yeah. plenty of tries. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and and upside down and all sorts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so... Um, Oh, and what I wanted to ask you is a little bit about your upbringing. So, as I said before, obviously your father's a bit of a legend, three-time British Superbike champion. So he raced from the 80s onwards. So is he still racing in some ways? Um, if you ask my mum, the answer is definitely no. <laughs> yeah. um, he actually said to my mum when he was 40, or he, he, late 30s, if not 40, he officially retired. Yeah. And he told my mum then if she caught him racing again, she had permission to shoot him. <laughs> but since then, there's still been a few. Um, I think since then, he's actually raced every year Has in it? one class or another. And yeah. but just like fun one off events, nothing serious anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, what I was wondering is when you were little, um, 
was that the decision to become a racer was that like already made like say by your dad or did you actually want to become a racer yourself um to be honest my dad wasn't bothered about me and my brother racing my mum really? definitely was she didn't want us to race at all. <laughs> yeah um, and very so, sensible yeah because of that we we did every other sport we played football and yeah. um, rugby cricket tennis we were sort of okay at every sport we're an athletic kid so we enjoyed yeah. playing sports um yeah. but neither of us we were okay we were sort of a jack of all trades and master of none at all other sports yeah um and when i was 14 uh, it didn't really start through me wanting to go racing we had a mini moto at the time yeah and we got a bit of a field where we lived so we were just riding this mini moto around on the grass yeah. and basically all i was trying to do was get my knee down and i couldn't get it down <laughs> So my dad said, oh, we should go to a track and you'll get it down. And yeah. I was like, at the age of, I think I was 12 or 13 then, I thought, I don't understand how that works. I don't understand why I'll get it down on a track if I can't do it here. Yeah. And we went to a track, obviously a little bit more grip, got my knee down. And that was it. I was quite happy with that. That was as far as it ever meant to go. Yeah. Um, but I sort of went OK. So I, I did a race and I finished third in my first race I ever did. Yeah. And that was it then. I'd got the bug. I was, I'd found something that I was naturally better at than other sports. And yeah. I think sports kind of always the combination of being good enough at it that you get encouraged to keep doing it and do it more. Yeah. And then because of that, you dedicate more time to it so you become better anyway. Whereas other yeah. sports, I was sort of okay at them, but because I wasn't the best at them, I wasn't that bothered about pursuing them. Yeah. That so. That was where it came from. And then right. whatever I did, Taz did too, my brother. So Taz yeah. started racing because I was racing. Yeah. Was <laughs> right. Yeah, like um, the competitive, how, how competitive are you two together then? Well, I'm the older brother, so I don't like having my little brother. <laughs> yeah. um, and we, but we're the best of mates. We've been best mates since we were kids. Um, and. I think now we're, we're at a point, I'm 27, nearly 28, and Taz is 25. Yeah. Um, so we're at a point where we're a bit more mature about it and we know which one's better <laughs> at different sports and different aspects of life and, yeah. and that's it. So we, we use it to our advantage really because um, we train together and there's a lot of yeah. areas he's stronger than me and other areas where I'm stronger than him. So we use that to our advantage and try and help the other one in that situation yeah. and then it's hard racing bikes because to have a career that's fairly plain sailing and you make progress every year um yeah and win races and have success it's hard enough when you've got one person but trying to intertwine two people doing it at the same time yeah exactly one of you has a bad year or a bad round and the other one has a good one and it's rare yeah. that we both have really good weekends the only year that really happened was 2016 where we both managed to win the championship in one year so yeah it has its it definitely has far more pros than it does cons having a a brother that races and yeah i mean i, I don't really think there's any negatives to it as far as we're concerned because we just yeah. use it to our advantage yeah and when when you first started getting into the you know the the sort of the, the more costly racing did um you get much support from you know like the with your name you know, like if yeah. you, you say, you know, I'm the son of Neil McKenzie, then, oh, oh, yeah, we yeah. can hook, hook you up with some leathers or I can, you know, did that help a lot? It did. It did. There was definite um, advantages to having my dad there. Yeah. What I, I think a lot of people don't realise is there was actually a lot of negatives to it as we, a lot of the time what we got was, oh, they're Neil McKenzie's kids, so they'll be all right. We don't actually. Ah, uh, yeah, them. yeah. Whereas when yeah. it's a young up and coming racer and people can see they really need help, then they'll help them out. But by saying that, we had a, an easier path than a lot of kids. Um, and we were very fortunate to have that, I'm extremely lucky. Um, yeah. The biggest advantage really of having my dad there was all the mistakes he made as a kid, because he was like a, a rags to riches story, if you like. He came from a council estate in the middle of central Scotland. He was digging yeah. holes for a living and he made it himself he, he got a bike and went racing um and because of that he made a lot of mistakes on his own growing up racing yeah. and 
we sort of shortcutted past all of those, which we kind of needed to because at 14, we started quite late, really. Most kids now start when they're, some are younger than six, but six, seven, yeah. eight years old, they start racing mini motos. So when I was 14 and I started, I'd missed out. I was sort of six years behind some kids in terms of racing. Yeah. So the, uh, we needed a bit of a fast track shortcut process, really, to get us on the ladder and get us performing well quickly. Yeah. So that definitely helped in that respect, yeah. And Mad Mark as well. Mad Mark, who is on <laughs> the YouTube channel, is loosely based on my dad at Portia. <laughs> Um, and he's also based on a lot of other dads that we've, I mean, both of us, as we're two years apart, we raced in the same categories as we grew up, grew up but we were, Taz was two years behind me because he was younger. So yeah. we're sort of two sets of dads, if you like, from yeah. different age groups. And races. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Mad Mark is definitely modelled on a lot of those. Yeah. Well, I, uh, my dad was not like a, a racing dad kind of thing, but he, uh, the first ever time, that I drove a car in the wet I took him out with me and I drove down this I lived in like Ox, in uh, Oxford so it's all countryside place and I bombed it down this road and just jumped on the brakes as hard as I could and just locked up the wheels and said why does um why does it do that <laughs> and he, was like, <laughs> he was like well because it hasn't got ABS and I was like what's ABS and um, <laughs> he was just just scared that I was just gonna you know fly off the side of a mountain or whatever so he yeah. in, he actually encouraged me to to try racing because i thought i was you know the fastest dude in the whole of oxfordshire and no one's gonna take yeah. me out but he um kind of i didn't know it at the time but he had lots of friends that had their own companies and so i think he asked them just pretend to be his sponsor so i had to, i put all their stickers on the car but i'm pretty sure my dad gave them the money to give me really? <laughs> yeah but he wasn't like push or anything he just he literally thought that if i carried on the way i was on the road that i was gonna crash and die cool. so yeah yeah, yeah so yeah I'm, I'm actually getting to that point now as well with bikes I, i've been riding bikes on the road for like 20 years i don't know how it's taken me this long to get onto a track but after the last time i rode on the track I couldn't be bothered to ride fast on the way home. Yeah. Like the, the, the way I normally ride on the road, I was just like, oh, that was good. I'm just going to cruise home and take it easy. Yeah. Letting Priuses overtake me after you, after you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's probably a, a good thing for people who are, you know, like pushing it a bit too much on the road. Like definitely take it to the track. Yeah. yeah. I get that. But, I do a lot of track day instruction and I get that a lot. Yeah. I have a lot of people that, come to me that I can tell they've got a bit of an air about them that they think they're the boy on the roads. They've yeah. they're the fastest out of all their mates. No one can Makes touch it, yeah. them on the roads where they are. Yeah. But then on the track and it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. And a lot of them still translate to being fast riders on the track, but yeah. it's just so much safer and you can go so much faster on a track. It's definitely the way forward. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so well um so back to when you were a kid we'll get off we'll get off this subject in a minute but did you um follow your dad's racing did you go to the races with him like um yeah yeah, yeah. so when, did hmm. go on no i was just gonna say if you got like a favorite uh memory or a good story from when you were watching your dad race yeah so i was three months old when i uh -huh. started going to racing um my dad was doing grand prix at the time the, what is now the MotoGP championship. Yeah. Um, so yeah, from three months old in 1993, I was just in a motorhome traveling around the paddocks doing Grand Prix. Yeah. So it's kind of all I've ever known. That was just the way I was brought up. I still yeah. had a normal education. I went back to school once I was um, old enough to do so. Yeah. Um, and by that point, my dad has started racing more in the British Superbike series. So my earliest memories uh, I can just about remember him in the Cadbury's Boost years, which was 96, 97, 98, but vaguely. My first yeah. real racing memory is in 2000, when he was teammates with Neil Hodgson in the GSC Ducati team. Yeah. And I don't know why this sticks in my mind. If you don't know, that season of racing was Neil Hodgson and Chris Walker, two British superbike yeah. riders. And it came down to one of the last races. The Stalker. Oh, the Stalker. Yeah. And... Chris Walker's engine blew up famously and Neil Hodgson won the championship. And that's my yeah. first real, I just remember being stood in pit lane with Neil Hodgson's wife 
or like yeah. ex-wife now. She was hyperventilating <laughs> in pit lane that he was going to yeah. win. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. my earliest racing memory. Yeah, that's about the time when I started riding, I think. I remember that, that final race. Like, that was that the last race of the season? Yeah, at Donington. Yeah, 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 I remember. I think I watched it in a pub or somewhere. <laughs> but everyone yeah. was like, oh, the stalker's going to get it. And then, boom. Yeah, yeah. that was... Yeah, I even had um, I had a seven four eight Ducati at that time, and I crashed it, and it was yellow, but I had it painted orange, and I got all the GSE stickers made and everything. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was a proper fanboy back then. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So, so you started um, you started in MotoGP, is that right? Like the the rookie. Cup yeah. Thing. Um, so basically i started racing mini motos that was where i first started and then yeah. i went from mini motos in 2006 and um, it was sort of the winter of 2006 to 2007 and then 2008 this was sort of the fast track um 2007 was my fast track year where i think i'm one of the fastest people to ever gain a race license in the uk i literally oh, raced, really? You have to gain 30 signatures, I think it was 30 signatures on your license before you can race yeah. your national championship yeah. and get your national license. So I, I just did 30 races back to back as quick as we could. Some weekends we were yeah. at one track on a Saturday and another track on a Sunday just to get more signatures. Yeah. Um, so that was in 2007 and that meant in 2008 I could do the British championship. And yeah. when I look back now, I, I literally had no idea what I was doing. I just <laughs> wobbled around and somehow... I went okay. I was 24th in my first race, and by the end of the season, I finished sixth in the British Championship race. So that was my progression that year. And because of that, I got a tryout in the Red Bull Rookie Cup um, and went there. And I went pretty good at the test. So I got a ride yeah. in the Red Bull Rookie Cup, which that test is basically just like the X Factor for kids <laughs> on bikes. Well, Britain's got yeah. talent on bikes. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I got a ride in Rebel Rookies, and that was what I did in two thousand nine and ten. Yeah, so you've basically you've raced. I don't know if you've raced in between, but you've got you've gone from like really the small bikes to the biggest bikes. Yeah. So was which which category or which championship do you think was the most like the toughest or the most competitive? Is it like the smaller bikes or is it the bigger bikes? Um, it's hard to say. I've raced in a lot of hard championships over the years, and I think as a, I've always, to a point, till sort of the, like 2014-ish, I always felt like I was a little bit behind in my career because I was always moving into a class that I wasn't good enough for, but right. just it was like sink or swim every year for me, which yeah. was hard at the time, but that definitely made me a better racer. So. In 2008, it was like sink or swim in British Championship, which was yeah. hard. Um, and then I got all the way to the front of that in 2010. I was winning races. So at the end of that season, um, I broke the lap record at Alton Park in Britain. So I moved on to Spanish Championship. And then when I got to Spanish yeah. Championship, again, it was like I was racing against um, Maverick Vinales and Alex <laughs> Rinder, <laughs> right, Alex yeah. Marquez. So there were some good names there. So again, yeah. that pushed me to another level. And then yeah. the following year after 2010, I moved into Grand Prix in 2011 and yeah. racing against those kids in a world championship, that was as hard as it got for me yeah. at that point. And I'd say that was the hardest year for me there. No matter what class you're racing in world championship, they're the best, well, they're yeah. kids effectively in one, two, fives, but they're the best of every country yeah. going head to head. So that was kind of as hard as it didn't get any easier after that <laughs> that was yeah. a noticeably hard year yeah yeah um, and what do you think what would you say is your eventual goal like um do you want to get into motor gp or world superbikes or what where do you really want to go you know funding and sponsorship you know if yeah. you've got it when i was a kid all you want to be is motor gp world champion That's yeah what you've got your heart set on yeah. and as i've got older and i'm 27 now i i just love racing bikes to be honest and i can yeah if i can carry on racing bikes that that's all i want to do and race bikes competitively i, I wouldn't want to just race bikes for the sake of it but if, I, yeah. if I can race bikes and be fast every year i'm grateful for every year i get to go racing yeah. and take nothing for granted so next this year if i can 
go racing again i'm chuffed and i'm happy and and hopefully yeah. i've got quite a few more years left yet of being competitive yeah. and being strong so i don't really have any wild expectations i just take each year as it comes really and just yeah. focus on that year try and do a good job and whether i move up to british superbikes the year after or um world superbikes so i'm just happy to be racing bikes to be honest yeah true true well, i don't think you're over the hill yet at 27 no i don't think so <laughs> no Looking at my dad at six years old, he's still racing, so I... Yeah, yeah. 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 So how's your knee, by the way? Is it all good now? Yeah, my knee's good. I, um, if, for people that don't know, I broke my leg and tore my MCL ligament in the field I'm looking at right now behind me. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I, I just made a right mess of it. My leg just went 90 degrees the wrong way, basically. Um, yeah. In the first UK lockdown we had. And it's taken till now, we're nearly, well, it's nine or 10 months on, and I'm pretty much back to 100% now. I can, yeah. The problem with it was that where I crashed and broke my leg, it then was in a brace for four months, and all the muscle wasted away on my leg. So then yeah. when it came out of the brace, it wouldn't straighten or bend properly. Yeah. Um, so I had to have a little operation to fix that, and then I'm, yeah, more or less there now. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I um, the last time I had a serious accident, I had, I had an accident, accident last year just on the, a local mountain. <laughs> oh, no. But it, all I did was dislocate my shoulder. But I, I've totally noticed that now I'm 41, right? So when I used to crash, just I'm just talking about like messing about on the road, like on roundabouts yeah. or whatever. It just, you know, the next day you could ride again, but I can, it still hurts. And now if I miss a shift or I get a false neutral on the bike and I, I sort of like get off the throttle really quickly, it hurts like Eat fuck. Yeah. yeah, and I'm pretty sure it's just because of age. But when I did break, break my leg, as like I think your doctor said nine months originally that you wouldn't yeah. be able to ride. Yeah. yeah, I was told that I wouldn't be able to walk for six months. But when I left the hospital, I left myself on crutches. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but yeah, yeah, injuries get more painful as you get older i think <laughs> even at 27 the difference i've noticed in the 10 years of my racing really I used to throw myself at a wall and not think twice about it i yeah. definitely don't enjoy it now i've never no. enjoyed it but I, mean, I feel it the next day more than I, I used to yeah yeah i've seen a video of your brother where he had a pretty nicely crash where he went just straight into the wall the tire wall yeah, and I, I saw yours where well you didn't really crash but where your bike set on fire and you literally jumped off yeah <laughs> so have you had it <laughs> yeah there's been a few incidents but when i watched your um your video like where you were explaining about your knee yeah. i i noticed that you didn't say how you broke it <laughs> so i was yeah. thinking he's done something stupid here it's not like yeah. a I was on the, the S1000 double R at 200 miles. Yeah, I, I figured something something yeah. you wanted to keep quiet a little bit. <laughs> Basically, what what happened was we were, we've got a, a field that we ride in on little yeah. 125cc bikes. And it is really good training because we race together and practice. Yeah. And especially in the first lockdown, we were really lucky that no one else could really ride because all the motocross tracks were shut. Yeah. So we were managing to get out and ride. And... I honestly felt like I was in the shape of my life. I'd done the most training I'd ever done. I was the fittest I've been and I was yeah. riding all the time here. So I felt really sharp. And then yeah. trying to explain to the team that I basically clipped a, I went one side of it. We used, we did, they've gone now, funnily enough, to safety <laughs> lured them yeah. out of our track. But we had little tires that were marking the corners out. Yeah. And my front wheel went one side of the tire and my leg went on the other side of the tire. And as I lost uh. the front, my foot got caught on the tyre and it just yeah. held my leg stationary basically as the oh. bike stood away from me. So Ouch. trying to ring the team to say, yeah, the season's about to start in a few weeks and I've broke my leg. Yeah. It sounds horrendous. I'm just messing about on a 125 yeah. bike in the backyard and that we tried to keep it as quiet as possible really. So <laughs> telling people. Yeah, that's what I figured had happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well, your knee aside, um, like how was 2020, 2020 for you in the end? Like, um, obviously you made a video about how you, you lost your ride for the, with the, you know, the BMW team, but it seems like things are looking up for next year, but overall, how was, um, last year? Um, I'm quite, I like to think I'm a positive person in general. So there's obviously a lot of 
bad things happened last year for lots of people and it wasn't an easy year for me. Yeah. Um, leading, but if we go back a season in 2019, I was having a good season really. I won quite a few races and I felt like sort of regained my confidence with racing and was was at a stage where I could move up to British Superbikes confidently. Yeah. As I'd done, yeah. I, I did a wild card round at the last round and I had three top 10 finishes. So I felt yeah. confident I could go up to BSB and do a good job. Yeah. So I signed with the official BMW team. Um, and as I said, I had a good winter's training and was ready to go. So the first five months of the year were really good. I felt like I was in a good place to go yeah. and race. Um, and then I broke my leg and that kind of just, it just messed the year up basically. I, yeah. I never really rode properly all season. I, I could ride, but I didn't realise until now I fixed my leg, how bad my leg, it wasn't bad as in, in a million bits, but just how much it was restricting me on the bike that yeah. I hadn't really, as a bike racer, you just go racing, you just think I'll be all right and I'll be fine. But I didn't realise yeah. how much it was affecting me. So as it happens, I scored more points in one race in that one wildcard race at the end of 2019 than I did yeah. in the entire season in 2020 of racing. So that oh, kind no. of says what kind of year it was really. Yeah. But aside from that, I started my own YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, yeah. As I broke my leg, basically, I was bored. I was sat there. I had nothing else to do. Yeah. That was why I did it. And that was a massive positive for me. I've, I really enjoy making videos now. Yeah. Um, it's a big part of my life. Um, every week I make a video and whether it's about racing or training or, or the odd comedy sketch, um, <laughs> that's what I do. So th that for me was a massive positive and I've used it now to try and help me go racing in 2021. So it's, um, yeah. there was pros and cons. It was, uh, it'd be quite easy to sit here and moan about last year and say it was a bad year, but yeah, there's no point doing that. it doesn't get no, there, isn't it? Exactly. No point. No point moaning. Um, yeah, so I, I've been doing this channel for basically a year and a half now, and it's take. I can't believe how long it's taken. Like, so I've only got thirteen hundred subscribers now, and it's literally taken a year to get that. And um, I was looking around at all the other kind of racers who've got their own YouTube channels, and like just bikes is just it's just so disappointing like um jonathan ray's only got fifteen thousand subscribers scott renning's got thirty thousand peter hickman's only got three thousand and then you look at you know like a formula one driver they've got millions yeah. so i get you know bikes i guess don't get that much exposure but compared to someone who's a professional racer there's all these idiots in california on you know harley davidson's doing motor vlogs like just drive riding to starbucks and stuff with millions of subscri subscribers yeah. so the whole like the youtube thing just like just messes with my head so much and so many times i just thought oh, i just can't be bothered to do this anymore but yeah like i just decided i'm gonna persevere with it because like like you said like when you started it, you you know you had nothing better to do really you were sitting around with your your knee in a in the you know whatever it, that that thing so i was kind of the same i started it when i was sort of in between job i'd quit a job and i wasn't happy where i was and i was thinking of what to do next and stuff so for me it was also like that it was like a perfect thing to do to fill the time but now i've come to really like it so so yeah i'm going to carry on doing it but yeah, I think what you're doing is really good as well because you started this You Race campaign. So you're basically what you're you're doing is with your ad revenue, as long as people watch the advert fully, you'll get some money from that. And then everyone who is a fan of your channel can contribute to you actually getting racing again. Is that that's yeah. the idea, right? Pretty much. Yeah. It, yeah. Basically, last year I got to the end of the season, and when I was looking for a ride for the following year, I realized a lot of people were, companies were struggling for money basically and, and yeah. money for our sport. So I, I needed to find money effectively to go racing the following year. That was the only way it was going to happen. Um, Cause if I've sort of got to go back a step really, but as a bike racer, you're only really as good as your last race. That's kind of how it works. So yeah, I'd had a bad year. So in the pecking order of who's going to get a ride, you're not in a strong position to, call the shots really is to to try yeah. and get right so it makes it far easier if you've got some funding 
Um, it's the same in most motorsport. I'm sure you've seen it. There's yeah. random F1 drivers appear at times with yeah. billionaire dads, and yeah. that's just how it works. That's if you've got yeah. money, it makes it easier. So I set about trying to find some money for myself, but I also realised it was going to be hard in the middle of this pandemic to approach companies because companies don't know, they didn't know whether they were coming or going and it's hard if they're making people redundant to go oh yeah here we go we'll chuck a load of money at this motorbike racer for yeah. him to go and burn on tires and fuel so <laughs> i wanted to try and create a way that was free for people to help me basically and that it yeah. didn't cost anyone anything but it was going to benefit me and in return it would mean i could race bikes um and film the whole thing from yeah. not having a ride all the way to hopefully getting a ride and going racing next year. Um, and yeah, it would hopefully be a bit of a cycle that the more bike racing content I made, the more people would watch it, which would bring more ad revenue in and it yeah. would just go in a circle like that. And the ad revenue doesn't cost anyone anything. If you watch my yeah. videos that way, then if you sit through a 20 second advert, then I think it gets me 0.003 of a penny or something but <laughs> eventually yeah. if you get enough views yeah. and people watching it it would begin to add up so that was my yeah, plan exactly, yeah yeah but we're not there yet but it's it's definitely yeah it's yeah helped. yeah that's good and are you, you sort of kind of hinted that you could be negotiating with some teams at the moment yeah any, well any news the best thing that i did was launch the project because I've had this twice in my career where I've been without a ride, but if you don't put it out there that you don't have a ride, then a lot of people, it just gets missed. It doesn't, Yeah. our sport doesn't really work that the managers, I don't know if it's, I'm just guessing that in football, there would be yeah. team managers or scouts that are going out looking for people to put in their teams and yeah. they get signed up that way. Whereas our sport is pretty much riders banging on race team doors saying, yeah. can I have a ride? And yeah. So if you don't put it out there that it's impossible to go bang on every single door and if you don't put it out there that you haven't got a ride, then um, nobody knows. So yeah. I did that, I, I put it out there and it it worked. There was a lot of people that got in touch that hadn't considered me for a ride. Um, yeah. Other people that were thinking about making teams that suddenly thought, oh, well, if we've got a rider that we could have, then we would do it. So there's... Yeah. The, over the course of the last few weeks there's been a, a lot of teams there's probably three teams now that uh that i could race for if i can get enough funding together and yeah. make it happen but yeah i'm in a bit of a, a race before that we even get to the racing that there's other <laughs> right to also do it too yeah. so yeah that's where i'm at basically yeah yeah i guess a lot of um people who might just be motorsport fans just don't kind of get the fact that it is just a business it looks yeah. like you know it's just you know combatants on a field or whatever but it's all dollar signs and sponsorship and stuff so yeah it's um it is tricky um especially the higher up you go in racing as well that was one thing i i didn't really enjoy about my year in grand prix in 2011 i absolutely yeah. loved the year it was the best thing i ever did and i got to travel the world and race against the best people in the world yeah but the problem well, the, the problem I had with MotoGP and the, the paddock is that is just a business. It is because there's so much more money involved. Obviously, the riders at the very top, the MotoGP racers, are getting paid a lot. Of, well, they're getting paid millions. Yeah. And even coming down the ranks into Moto2 and one, two, or Moto3 now, the riders, some of the riders there are paying hundreds of thousands of euros to yeah, yeah. rides. So it's quite a high pressure environment because whether you're getting paid or you're paying, there's a lot of money involved. And yeah. that was one side I didn't really like about it because suddenly there's these slick back Italian managers walking about and there's yeah. all sorts of people that worm their way in trying to look for their piece of the pie. And, and yeah. I don't really like that. I like going racing because I like riding my bike and trying my best and trying to win races and yeah when all the money side comes into it, it it's a necessary evil but I, mm. I prefer not having to deal with that side of it yeah 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 it's like um you need it's better to have someone to look after that side of things for you so you can just focus on you know your health and your training and actually yeah. racing yeah 
It's uh, like the, it's just the, the modern way as well. You know, you've got to be careful what you say. You got to be careful what you do off track. You got to be careful what pictures you put on Instagram and stuff. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's not like the old days where you just turn up on a you know a bike that you bought from the dealership with some tires that you borrowed off your mate or whatever. So yeah, yeah, things are changing. I guess it's for the better, but I'm not quite convinced yet. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I asked my dad about this because my dad sort of came from. Um, the 1980s when it was completely different there was a lot more money in the paddock and there was um, cigarette mm. money that was funding a lot yeah. of racing. Um and now it's kind of all patched together with little sponsors that are all coming mm. together yeah and I d it's just completely it's a completely different way of going racing but in some ways it's better because it's a lot easier for a for someone like me if I was racing in the 1980s and I was trying to get some money together to go racing I could yeah. only really go around my town and bang on all the little engineering workshops and say, yeah, can I have yeah. some money to go racing? Whereas now I can put a video on YouTube and yeah. if, if enough people see it, then you've got a chance of exposing yourself to more people. So yeah. it has its pros and cons, but... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely easier to promote yourself these days, that's for sure. Yeah. On the flip yeah. side, I would quite like to be Barry Sheen where you could just do what you want <laughs> the next day. <laughs> Yeah, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? Yeah. <laughs> I'm more of a James Hunt guy. I wanted to be James, James Hunt. Hunt yeah, I, I like James Hunt too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, and again, wrapping up toward to getting towards the end now. But I wanted to ask you: Do you do you ride road bikes as well? Do you ever ride on the road? Yeah, I've got one thing. My dad he did force me into doing this was getting my road bike license because when I was huh. young, I had no interest in riding on the road. I just wanted to race yeah. bikes. Um, but he forced me to do my uh, road license because he knew that jobs appear where you need a road license for, whether it's right, yeah. doing jobs in magazines or yeah. just loads of little jobs. And now, so quite well, pretty much every winter, I work for Triumph Motorcycles. They launch three or four new bikes every winter, and I go on the launch yeah. of each bike, taking right. the press out and doing yeah. those rides. So that's the main... Um, place where i do all my road rides riding yeah. and i'm really lucky in tenerife yeah in, in tenerife or wherever tenerife, in Gran, yeah. Canaria, Gran canaria yeah yeah nice. they're, they're kind of limited this year where they can go obviously with what's yeah. going on um yeah that's yeah. my favorite thing to do yeah yeah that is um kind of like one of my I haven't said it, but it's like my goal for the channel is to get enough um, subscribing and stuff so that I can then approach manufacturers and say, can I do, you know, can I join your press launches? Yeah. And that's what I want to do. So give oh, it up. It's definitely possible. <laughs> I've definitely, I've been doing it about three or four years now. And there's yeah. a definite shift in manufacturers that used to just, well, Triumph, effectively. They yeah. definitely had a lot more in the past it was traditional media it was um just your classic bike magazines that yeah your normal six magazines that would get the pick of the rides yeah. but the last few launches that have gone on there's a definite slight shift towards influencers and youtube yeah channels. i've noticed it yeah yeah and it, i think it's quite interesting that that's because really as the world's going that way there's less people reading magazines and more people watching yeah exactly so it makes more sense for a manufacturer to do that yeah. so stick at it and I'm sure it'll yeah <laughs> yeah nudge nudge wing wink yeah so um, yeah I uh, I noticed as well that on some of these like you said influencers I've watched their videos from like before a press launch and then watched the actual you know their r r ride review video and I was thinking like how when did they become such amazing filmmakers and when did they buy that expensive camera because those shots are amazing and then i realized you watch every single like influencer person's review video and it's the same footage so yeah. do the triumph like provide cameramen and stuff to to shoot well, stuff I for them. did a video on exactly that it's on my oh, really? channel yeah it's called uh i can't remember what i call it dirty little bike review secrets or something oh uh, okay and it is exactly that. It's um, oh, right. <laughs> basically you'll if you watch the video, you'll see. You yeah. go from one location, you take the press to that location. They all pass through the same corner. Mm -hmm. There's two cameramen set up, two cameramen and two videographers set up. But yeah. They all do three or four passes past the camera, um, mm. 
and then you move to the next location they do it again and yeah that's how it works so they're, they're kind of like they're not pre-produced but they are in a way that that's, yeah that's why everyone's review ends up looking similar really. yeah it looks yeah they look similar but they look so perfect as well yeah yeah and then, then when their next video comes out it, it's back to the old their back old standards to, <laughs> GoPro like this. yeah yeah, like. yeah. I think yeah. the team that triumph views they also do um i'm pretty sure it's porsche they do a lot of work for oh right Aston martin as well so they're a good company they're called kingdom creative there are some really good guys there they do some oh, really right. cool work awesome all right well I thank you again for giving me up your time. I don't know. I've, I think I think we got through all of my questions in a sort of roundabout way. Everything I had pla I've had planned to say in this order and this order, but it all just got thrown out the window. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I think you're obviously you're a pretty positive guy, and everything's looking good for this year, is it? You think a couple of months and you should be on a bike? Do you reckon? Fingers crossed. I mean, we've got a bit of a delayed start now. They've moved the season yeah. to the first week of June, which gives me a little bit more oh, time really? to find get ready. Yeah. Um, uh, but I'm just training as if I'm going racing and yeah, yeah keep my fingers crossed and keep yeah. working hard. I'm sure it'll happen. Is it going to be the same as last year? Like no spectators allowed and stuff like that? Or is it? I hope not because it's not the same yeah. without a crowd there. Yeah. Um, but it's really hard to say at the minute. I, I, mm. they're planning on spectators coming that's the idea that's mm. what they want to do but at the minute in England I'm not sure what it's like for your American uh, viewers but in England at the minute I, we can leave oh we've got a oh who's yeah, that dad, you're now live on oh. YouTube oh no it's, is it Mad Mark or is that Mad your dad Mark on YouTube who is it you just wrap it up and you can have right, office okay. back <laughs> 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 yeah so old people like him have to shelter indoors and we can yeah. only put the shops for essentials at the minute so yeah. yeah until that's over i don't it's hard to see what it'll be like going racing yeah well if it if the season gets cancelled it looks like the uh suzuka eight hour endurance race is going to go ahead is it Oh, cool. yeah they've sort of they've sort of announced that it isn't going to be and then a guy that i know that works at yamaha said i think it will go ahead so oh, cool. when you get yourself over to japan i'll be your uh, translator as i previously agreed yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i'd love yeah. to hold you to that because i would love to do suzuka i think it'd be a, it'd be an awesome video to make as well so definitely yeah welcome. hell yeah yeah like uh, who didn't one of your teammates race there last year Bradley Ray, he's raced there a few yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of British riders come over and do it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's try and stick that on your to do to do list. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm big on my to do list. I've got so many videos and. Things <laughs> yeah. yeah. Getting through them all. You have to hire a cameraman soon, probably. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Fingers crossed. If it all goes well enough, that will be the next. Yeah. Yeah, one. yeah. A social media manager or something like that. <laughs> yeah. get way above my station <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right well again thank you very much for your time and i wish you the best of luck for 2021 cool. thank you very much thanks for having so, me so have you got a spare place on the shelf there for a another uh, trophy? well these are all my dads i just used them to no. make myself <laughs> <laughs> just throw them away <laughs> make some space <laughs> all right thanks a lot mate all right. okay no worries speak to you soon See you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.